Hello, everyone. We are pleased to have you join us for Gar Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. Welcome to today's live broadcast. Shiga toxin producing E. coli, what you need to know now. I am Bob Woodard of Lab Roots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots and sponsored by Alere. Alere delivers reliable and actionable information through rapid diagnostic tests resulting in better clinical and economic healthcare outcomes globally. For more information, please visit alere.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This presentation has been approved for continuing education credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner of the auditorium. This will direct you to the necessary site and form needed to receive your credits. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to submit answers during the event. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A window, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left-hand corner of the presentation window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon at the lower right-hand corner of the screen window. If you have any technical problems during the webcast, please click on the support button located at the upper right-hand corner of the presentation window. You can also submit any problems you may be having using the Q&A box. Following this presentation, head over to the Community of Learning in the Lab Exchange lobby to have the opportunity to engage in a live chat and have more of your questions answered on the spot about Shiga toxin-producing E. coli, what you need to know now. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Norman Moore. Dr. Moore is the Director of Scientific Affairs for Alere. He received his bachelor's degree in biology and philosophy from Dartmouth College and his PhD in microbiology from the University of New Hampshire. Dr. Moore developed the first ever rapid test for Legionella and Streptococcus pneumoniae, both of which are now recommended by the Infectious Disease Society of America for use in severe pneumonia cases. Dr. Moore has multiple patents, publications, and presentations, and now serves as the Director of Scientific Affairs for Infectious Diseases. He has served on multiple National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Grant Committees, the College of American Pathology Point of Care Committee, and the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute Guideline Committee for Point of Care Infectious Disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Moore to today's event. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Well, thank you all very much. So uh, with that introduction, I'd like to get right into it. And again, feel free to ask any questions at the end. We're going to be talking about shiga toxin today. Now, I give a fair amount of lectures, and one of the great driving threats, one of the things that really links all of diagnostics together when you're talking about infectious disease is what it means to the world. To the world. When you think of the, the great threats to humankind, certainly things like terrorism and nuclear weapons come to mind, but when you talk to the people out there, and all the leaders, if you go down to the CDC and you say, what keeps you awake at night? It's basically antibiotic resistance. We have, at this point, conditioned so many of our doctors to give out big, broad-spectrum antibiotics every time somebody comes in with a sickness that we have, and it's no surprise to anybody here, significant amounts of resistance in the hospitals today. So I mean, at this point, if you screened everybody right now, roughly 10% of people have staph voice in their nose, and actually 1% to 2% of people in the community have methicillin-resistant staphylococcus in their nose right now. So it's something that's very significant, and it's going up not only hospital-acquired, but community-acquired as well. So and I give a lot of, when, when I give a lot of microbiology talks, it's, I start with, quite often with an interesting quote. As a microbiologist, this is my favorite quote. Back in 1970, which isn't too long ago for a lot of us, uh, the Surgeon General said, the United States is ready to close the book on infectious disease as a major health threat. Now, back in 1970, infectious diseases really weren't even in the top 10 killers. And so when you look at what's happened, you know, you go to 1995, and it's the number three killer only behind heart disease and cancer. And of course, today, uh, it, it's a critical, critical concern. In a lot of ways, we've gone backwards. You know, so we, everybody thinks of medicine always improving, but we have taken that wonderful treasure of antibiotics and at this point so abused it 
that we are now getting infections that we, we can't quite often control. We now have cases where, you know, a child comes in with a simple otitis media. The first round of antibiotics doesn't work. The second round of antibiotics doesn't work. Uh, they can become septic and, and, and sometimes die. Now, there are other issues, too, with vaccinations, which I won't get into. Uh, but suffice it to say, right now, we are in some ways worse off than we were decades ago. And again, when we talk about these antibiotics, what is amazing is the amount of overuse. When you look at these places, you know, if you go into a hospital right now, one in every three patients is going to receive uh, usually two or more antibiotics. And when you look at all the antibiotics given to these patients, about 75% are either unnecessary or redundant. So again, we have that mental feeling of, in some ways, no harm, no foul, where just because it might be uh, a bacterial infection, let's throw as many antibiotics at it as possible, and that leads to all these other complications. And even with just uh, the amount of upper respiratory illnesses, we're prescribing tens of millions of antibiotics when we really don't need that. Not only is there a medical cost, but there's a financial cost. When you look at uh, what's happening with a lot of the medical systems right now, they're going to be uh, incurring the burden of uh, any hospital-acquired infections. So, you know, if you're at a hospital and your MRSA rate is high, if your C. difficile rate is high, and the patient gets that infection there, it's going to dramatically increase lengths of stay as well as hurt that particular patient. So you look at beyond that is about a billion dollars spent unnecessarily on these antibiotics and so when you look at the total cost to, to society right now we're talking about 20 billion dollars in healthcare costs uh, about 35 billion in societal costs societal costs are going to be uh, missing work missing school um, and that's going to account for about 8 million additional hospital days uh, when you look when you really think about diagnostics when you think about disease if you know more specifically what is causing that disease, uh, you really open up a lot of options to have better directed therapy. And once you have better directed therapy, you do have better outcomes. And so this is, uh, I don't have too many quotes. I think this is my last quote, but it's one that I think really kind of makes people stop and think, you know, post-antibiotic era means, in effect, an end to modern medicine as we know it. Things as common as strep throat or a child's scratch knee could once again kill. And so I know that sounds dramatic, but we're at a point where the things can get quite dramatic. And I know that there's pressure on doctors. I know that there is pressure to prescribe antibiotics. When, when a parent comes in with, with a sick child, uh, they want to be treated. Even if it's a influenza and an antibiotic is going to do no good whatsoever, what we need to do as a medical community, and it's not an easy thing, is really try to help educate the entire community that there is actual harm when you give antibiotics when they're not necessary. When we look at things, uh, we are increasing the amount of resistance. Uh, that is significant. And if I talk to more parental groups, there are other issues as well. If I give an antibiotic, it's not only killing the quote-unquote bad bacteria, it's, it's actually creating resistance in the good bacteria as well. So if I keep giving antibiotics to children, what can happen is your commensal, your normal healthy bacteria, will become resistant. And then when you get a subsequent pathogen, they can actually share that genetic information so that uh, you can have a reservoir of resistance that can actually go to the pathogen afterwards. So there is harm by giving antibiotics over and over again. So it really, to a lot of these people, you're taking that antibiotic as a choice away because you now have that uh, residual layer of resistance. And, and even beyond that, uh, they're now linking a lot of childhood obesity to antibiotics. And when you think about it, you, you've got a normal, healthy gut flora. And if you start destroying that normal, healthy gut flora and you're not able to process you know, foods as well, uh, it can lead to obesity. Uh, it's also, antibiotics does lead to things like yeast infections as well. So when you put all that together, we are trying to go more toward a lot of antibiotic stewardship where we're really trying to, you know, there are wonderful guidelines out there. You know, groups like the Infectious Disease Society of America look at every article published and put out these guidelines every few years and they've got their best practices. So looking toward uh, what those guidelines say, who you should be testing for what, 
in how that therapy should be given is, is really quite helpful. So when you've got those guidelines, this, these stewardship committees can look, make sure that the optimal uh, outcomes are given by the right antibiotics. And again, if you give the right antibiotic, you have other less issues. Uh, I give a lot of C. difficile lectures and I can talk an entire hour on uh, how to clean a room from C. difficile spores. C. C. difficile spores are very, very hardy. Um, but then the question comes in, if you're decolonizing every patient that walks in uh, by giving them these broad spectrum antibiotics, so your entire patient population is now susceptible to C. difficile, it's really hard to control. So if you're talking about C. difficile and you're worried and you're spending tons of money on hand, sanitiza hand and sanitization and cleaners, et cetera, if we don't change our prescribing practices and everything's linked together, in some ways it's a waste of money. So when you put that stewardship uh, group together, you can again preserve those antibiotics for when you do need it, and then you actually do reduce costs. And I'll say one more thing on this before going to C. difficile, I mean before going to shigatoxin, and that is a lot of people think that these broad spectrum antibiotics are the most effective killers, and they're not. When you think of something like vancomycin, uh, there is significant kidney damage, and it is not going to get you out of the hospital any earlier, and quite often it can get you out later. If something like streptococcus pneumoniae is the pathogen and it's susceptible to penicillin, penicillin is uh, more effective, has less cost, and will decrease the length of stay. So knowing what pathogen you're dealing with does help. And so basically, I won't spend too much time on it, but just to say when you put a committee together, you really want to include a lot of different areas of that hospital. So when we now start talking about diagnostics, it is uh, becoming more and more important to really understand, do the testing so that you can better target uh, what that pathogen is and treat accordingly. Uh, that's going to have a lot of benefits from reducing the antibiotic overuse, that shorten that uh, time to the, that appropriate therapy. Uh, again, we talked about providing targeted treatment and, and not having those broad spectrums because we really do need to hold on to those broad spectrum uh, antibiotics when we truly do need them. For many years, um, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies uh, realized that there were a lot more profitable drugs out there. You know, unfortunately, things like, um, there, there, there just are more thing, you know, things that can be, uh, get far more money. Um, so what they did was they looked at their pipeline and they said, okay, let's, uh, not spend as much time on antibiotics. And so when they spent less time on antibiotics and more time on things like Viagra, you know, Viagra is something that, that people love taking over and over again, so it was a highly, highly profitable drug. With something like antibiotics, if doctors abuse it, it is going to become uh, less uh, effective and therefore it's got a shorter shelf life. Uh, now they have turned on the pipeline for new antibiotics, but we are still potentially about 10 years away. And because of that, we really have to save what we have right now for when we truly need it. So when we talk about uh, gastrointestinal disease, uh, one of the big issues is it's very, very difficult to diagnose on symptoms alone. These symptoms are so ubiquitous, so even, that it's very, very hard to understand really what the pathogen is. And there are actually hundreds of potential causes, and quite often when you have that diarrhea, it does lead to this treatment. And again, we do worry that some of these uh, treatments uh, may actually hurt the patient. So again, knowing the pathogen is better. As an example of hurting that patient, uh, one of the things that we've seen right now is things like C. difficile. Um, a lot of people that are healthy can carry C. difficile. And uh, what can happen is if they take an antibiotic for respiratory disease, for example, um, antibiotics can cause diarrhea. When they cause diarrhea, if we then find C. difficile, we can potentially then give them another antibiotic to then, you know, hopefully thinking that we're removing the C. difficile, we're decolonizing that patient and potentially giving them, uh, now making them susceptible to a subsequent infection with C. diff. So it gets very, very confusing. So diagnostics really do help try to delineate exactly what they have. As a general issue, diarrhea kills about 1.5 to 2.5 million children a year. So it's a very, very significant worldwide disease. And in certain parts of the world, we're talking about uh, people getting cases of diarrhea five to 18 times every single year. 
Now, luckily in the United States, we have a, a, a bit more better sanitation. So what we're seeing in the U.S. right now is adults tending to get one acute case per year, uh, young children tending to get about two cases per year. So that all leads to about uh, you know, a quarter billion cases right now in the United States each year. Uh, a lot of the concern of those cases are the children under five, and that rolls into a lot of other complications where you're talking about tens of millions of physician consultations. Uh, certainly with parents, they have a lot of concerns when the, when the child is young, and so they are bringing them in for a lot of uh, diarrhea. That's going to lead to almost two million cases of hospitalizations, uh, about 3,100 deaths, and when you look at it all in total, about 25 billion uh, to the healthcare community right now. When we look at foodborne illnesses, uh, which can often, quite often, come with uh, gastrointestinal illness, we're talking about 76 million cases, uh, 325,000 hospitalizations, and about 5,000 deaths. So I put up a picture of uh, the IDSA guidelines just to kind of show that you don't have to test everybody for diarrhea for absolutely everything. When they've got a hospital acquired, quite often you do link to C. difficile. When they're coming in from the community, that's when you start looking at things like Salmonella, Shigella, Campy, uh, the E. coli is a 157. We are getting more C. difficile coming in from the community, but uh, that's another concern, another topic. And if they've got that persistent diarrhea, if they've been traveling, if they've been hiking, uh, quite often you then start thinking of things like Giardia and Cryptosporidium. Now, I'm gonna, not going to go through all the etiological agents for diarrhea, uh, but just to say there are many causes. Obviously, with the viral infections, an antibiotic does no good whatsoever. The, one of the big ones out there is norovirus. Uh, so again, if you've got an outbreak in a community, quite often it can be due to that. I actually have the unfortunate time that the last time I got a norovirus infection, I was actually at a conference at the National Institute of Health. So I was actually food poisoned at NIH, which is kind of an interesting story to have. When you look at those bacterial infections, again, we talked about Campylobacter, Salmonella, et cetera. We've also got the parasites. But let's start diving now into uh, E. coli and then more specifically, sugar toxin producing E. coli. E. coli is something that is uh, ubiquitous in the gut. It's, it's in every person's gut right now. And around actually 10% of your fecal mass is E. coli cells. And if you break apart E. coli cells, that's what gives uh, stool a lot of the aroma that you know and love out there. So it is very common and it's okay to have E. coli. The issue is quite often if you put bacteria in the wrong area of the body, that's when they can become a problem. Yes, that, uh, there are particular types of E. coli that can cause diarrhea, but again, if they're in the wrong place, they can cause urinary tract infections, uh, respiratory illnesses, and even things like pneumonia. And we do use E. coli for many other things. Uh, when you're looking for, at E. coli, that tends to be the big one that we use for a lot of our uh, uh, genetic work. Uh, we even use it for monitoring things like water quality. So if you're out in the community and you hear things like there's a high fecal coliform, what that means is you are getting bacteria that are normally present in a warm-blooded animal. It's in the water and therefore it serves as a monitor that if there are things like E. coli, then there are, can be any other enteric pathogen as well. And that can get into the water by many ways, uh, you know, farm irrigation runoff. Uh, if you're out in the you know, farming area and you've got a septic system and that septic system is leaking, that can go right to the well. So there's lots of ways to get E. coli out there. When we talk specifically about E. coli, uh, sugar toxin producing, um, it's got a few different names out there. So if you're out there and you hear things like NR hemorrhagic E. coli, uh, virocytotoxin uh, E. coli, basically it's all the same thing. It produces a, 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 that toxin called sugar toxin, and actually it is identical to uh, the toxin produced by Shigella. What had happened was at some point in its evolutionary history, Shigella was there and some of the E. coli picked up this toxin and it is basically molecule for molecule, the same one out there. Now, the big one that we all have heard about is E. coli 0157H7. This is the one that had the outbreak in uh, ja the Jack in the Box uh, food chain. This is the one that's had a lot of outbreaks where you have to bring the meat back in. Um, that's the one we're usually the most concerned about. 
Uh, however, it is noted that there are a lot of other E. coli's that also have that shiga toxin producing uh, gene. Therefore, just looking for E. coli I0157 is not going to be able to uh, identify everybody with this particular illness. So as far as the shiga toxin, it basically comes in two main groups, one and two. I won't spend too much time on that. Um, but basically what it does it is a, a toxin that does inhibit protein synthesis. And there are other complications, which we'll get into, things like hemolytic uronic syndrome. A couple other things about shiga toxin producing E. coli. Um, it doesn't sound important, but it is quite important, is that it is actually quite acid tolerant. And the reason why that's important is because quite often if you ingest something, uh, a bacteria, your gut, your, your, the you know, hydrochloric acid in your stomach is something that's quite often able to uh, deactivate it. With E. coli 0157, it can survive you know, your stomach acid uh, much more readily and therefore uh, much more likely to give you disease. There's actually a lot of foods out there that are also high in acid. If uh, you know, you've got things like salmonella, I mean, uh, salami or, or some of those type of meats, uh, believe it or not, these uh, E. coli 0157 have been able to survive that and, and be part of that. Now, also when you're talking about infectious disease, quite often, you need a large amount of uh, bacteria to actually become sick. You know, one bacteria doesn't make an illness. One of the unfortunate difficulties with E. coli 0157 is it is one of those low dose infections. You don't need that many cells to actually cause disease. And the third thing on this is that it is actually a bit more common in the summer months. And uh, it's more common in the summer months because quite often you do get things like uh, outdoor activities like swimming and barbecues. And all of those things have an ability to spread it, which we'll see in the next few slides. So when you talk about these symptoms, uh, well, uh, they do vary person to person. So what can happen is if a whole family is infected, quite often it can be subclinical. So there's going to be people that really don't never know it. You know, they get it, they get over it, they don't even have any symptoms. However, as part of the main symptoms, if you do have a bigger case, a diarrhea obviously is the bigger one. Uh, it tends to be potentially bloody. Now, blood in the stool is is fairly indicative. That is a concern. People should go right to the hospital when they have blood in the stool. Uh, unfortunately, people don't. You know, if, if the blood is a bit older, you know, the, the color can darken. Uh, unfortunately, with a lot of kids, um, they actually get embarrassed when they see blood in the stool and don't tell their parents. So, uh, don't look just that it has to be blood in the, in, the, in the stool to really have this concern. Beyond that, it's severe stomach cramping, vomiting. Uh, some of these people do have a fever as well. Uh, if as a general rule, this does resolve on its own around five to seven days. Unfortunately, there are some complications to cigatoxin producing E. coli. Uh, around five to 10% are, get a thing that we mentioned earlier called hemolytic uremic syndrome. So basically the symptoms of this, again, we talked about the bloody diarrhea. They're not able to urinate. Uh, these people are quite tired and you actually see a loss of that pink color in their cheeks and on the inside of their lower eyelid. And I know that sounds a little bit odd, but what's happening here is um, the kidneys actually may stop working. Um, and that's the biggest complication of hemolytic uremic syndrome. So some of these people do recover, but some of them unfortunately do suffer permanent damage and it is potentially life-threatening for especially children under five. So what's the whole mechanism in all this? Basically you have this toxin, it's going to cause the blood cells to misshapen, and these blood cells will actually clog these tiny vesicles in the kidneys. And once that happens and the filtration by the kidneys does become blocked, the kidneys start shutting down. So again, the biggest problem out there with E. coli 0157 really more often than not is these kids because of hemolytic uremic syndrome. However, however, there are other things out there as well. There's a thing called thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And again, what's happening out there is these toxins will start changing the shapes of the red blood cells. You're going to have clots start forming uh, all over in blood vessels. And that is going to have some impairment and that oxygen is start, starting to not get to the organs, you know, brain, heart, kidneys. But one other, other thing is all of these platelets, because of this, get used up. And therefore, you start getting a lot more internal bleeding. Uh, so you're actually going to be seeing spots under the skin, lots of cuts. Uh, this uh, particular illness tends to be more likely in adults. 
Now, some people do confuse incubation periods out there. Um, if you're at a restaurant and you get sick later that night, people tend to blame the restaurant, but usually most of these foodborne pathogens have an incubation period. This one tends to be three to four days. However, if you look at all literature, it can be one to 10. Uh, and again, the symptoms vary over the time. You may start off with that stomach ache to that mild diarrhea, and that does become more significant as time rolls by. If you are worried about hemolytic syndrome, that usually happens about a week after the initial symptoms. So you get diarrhea a week later on is when we have that more significant illness. As far as the stats go on this, uh, when you look at the Center for Disease Control website, which they try to update as often as they can, uh, we're talking about uh, just on this alone about a quarter million cases each year in the United States. And out of that quarter million cases, that E. coli 157 is responsible for a little more than a third. So the issue is if you're only looking for E. coli 0157, you're missing almost two thirds of those cases. Now, that's a fairly high number. And you would think with such a high number that we would actually be seeing more cases in hospitals right now. And a lot of places screen and don't see a high number. Um, so why aren't they seeing? Well, you know, a lot of people when they have, have diarrhea do not seek medical attention. And it's something that quite often is embarrassing for a lot of people. and uh, Quite often, they think it can resolve on their own. Um, and quite often, even with shigatoxin, toxin, it can resolve on their own, and many of them uh, do. Um, so that's quite, quite often why we don't actually see them coming in. Uh, there are people that may not give that stool sample. So it's something, unfortunately, like a sputum sample. You can get a sputum sample fairly readily. Stool samples don't come in as often. Um, and unfortunately, there are many laboratories that are actually not able to equip to be uh, testing stools as well. They have to quite often have to send it off to a reference laboratory. But one of the big issues is we do want to diagnose it soon because this is something where you can be infecting other people. So again, we mentioned that these uh, do produce toxins. Uh, they do go away with symptoms. However, we do find individuals that the symptoms actually may resolve, but they can still have sugar toxin E. coli in their gut producing, and at that point, um, they can be potentially infecting other people. So these are the people that if they're working in a daycare or cooking, uh, they may have no symptoms. But if they've got this they and they uh, don't uh, wash their hands appropriately after going to the bathroom, uh, again, with these small amounts of E. coli that can produce disease, uh, they can be significant vectors. So if you've had uh, a sugar toxin E. coli infection, it's important to keep washing your hands for a much longer time afterwards. So I kind of wanted to mention a few of the uh, fairly more recent outbreaks in the last few years. Uh, first off, just, just to kind of explain how this gets transmitted, uh, there's multiple ways. Uh, the big one that we quite often know about is the fecal oral route. We talked about the hand washing. Uh, when you're out there and you've dealt with a patient, uh, you really want to be able to wash your hands and, and the general rule right now is saying happy birthday to yourself twice. Um, hand washing is very, very effective at a lot of pathogens. Um, even things like C. difficile, when you're out there and you're washing your hands, soap and water does not kill C. difficile spores, but what it does is it makes them mobile. And when it makes them mobile, you're able to rinse them away. So washing your hands is always a good thing. Um, obviously beyond uh, just the direct stool from one person to another, uh, you could be getting things like dealing with food. Uh, so if you've got somebody that's dealing with food, that's the way it can be passed. Um, and I won't go through all of the ways where you can find uh, fecal coliforms. You know, if you go to a, a restaurant, quite often they don't find fecal coliforms in the uh, candy dish that's right next to the register. There's a lot of different areas where you can actually find these pathogens. Um, certainly in daycares with all the diapers around there, that can be an issue. When we start looking at food exposures, um, uh, we can get meat that's contaminated during processing. And just to kind of spend a quick minute on that, what you normally see is uh, sugar toxin is usually not in steak. And the reason for that is when you have a steak, um, if, a, if a cow has E. coli 157 in their gut, uh, if it gets on their hide during the processing, with a steak, you normally cook it and you cook the outsides and that's where the pathogen is and it's killed off fairly readily. Uh, however, when you've got something like a hamburger, you take what's on the outside, grind it up and it's now on the inside. And once it's on the inside, 
and you don't cook your burger straight through, that's where a lot of these outbreaks can happen. Uh, when then when we go to environmental exposures, um, we do have things like water parks where we've had outbreaks and um, we can go to places like petting zoos where some of the animals can have it. The kids can pet the animals and then if they don't wash their hands, they can contaminate themselves. So there's a lot of different areas that they can get that. So here's a few of the things out there and I'll kind of hit a few of these. Um, I talked about the burger. That's why if you go to mo nearly all fast food restaurants have a very strong protocol these days for cooking their meat. So we really have not seen a lot of outbreaks in a lot of the uh, in food these days because of some of the procedures they've put in place. Uh, I've mentioned those cows, but again, one of the issues out there is, you know, when you're out in a cow pasture and they've got E. coli 157 or any other sugar toxin producing E. coli, you know, the cows uh, defecate in the pasture and there's often runoff. And so you find cases where you'll have things like apple cider. Uh, so the cow pasture runs off, it gets onto the apples, and we don't, when you don't pasteurize that cider, and again, cider has a nice acidity which kills off a lot of the bacteria, E. coli 157 is one of those that are resistant to those uh, low pHs. Therefore, you can have outbreaks in apple cider. We've had the unpasteurized milk. Again, uh, by having runoff from other animals, you can get other foods. And then you get that nice little daycare as well, unfortunately. So uh, I, I took one of the publications, and you can see the publication down below. But they're saying, all right, where do we actually find E. coli 157? And in the latest publication I was able to find on this, we talked about that water. We talked about the farm environments. Uh, beef, again, being one of the more significant ones, other meats as well. But you've got that dairy and that produce. So a lot of foods aren't safe because of that runoff. Oh, I'm sorry, I've covered that slide already. So going into a few of the outbreaks that we've had out there, uh, back in uh, June 2014, there was a case of uh, E. coli 15787, the one, the, the big bad one that we worry about, in ground beef, so that's fairly uh, standard. What happened in this particular case was they had 12 cases, seven of them were hospitalized. It did span four states because, of course, a lot of these packing plants do distribute all over the country. Uh, the good news on that one is there were zero deaths, but what they found is that at the particular packing plant, they did have contaminated ground beef. And that unfortunately, with that ground beef, it was distributed uh, uh, to many restaurants and retail areas throughout the country. Uh, one of the actions, however, is the recall happened after the expiry date. But again, we have to have recalls even after the expiry on things like food uh, because quite often people do freeze it. So people at that point had to check their uh, frozen meat to make sure that they didn't have this particular lot and uh, get rid of it if they did. Another one in 2014, uh, rather than E. coli 157, this was an E. coli 121. And this occurred in raw clover sprouts. So again, we had about uh, 19, 19 cases. Uh, almost half of them were hospitalized, again, zero deaths. Uh, and what they had done is they had actually linked this to uh, Evergreen Fresh Sprouts. This was a place in Idaho that had these uh, contaminated raw clover sprouts. And when they do the epidemiology, trying to figure out what is the cause, they did find that four out of five people uh, that had these raw clover sprouts the week before, at, often at these restaurants. So that was what led them to the, uh, this particular place. So when the FDA inspectors then did go in, they did see areas of unsanitary conditions, uh, so they had corroded metal, contact, uh, this was in contact with food, and so basically the, uh, this particular company was able to uh, get rid of that seed lot. And one in 2013, this was an E. coli 121 in Farmer's brand frozen food. So again, this is one of these areas where you had 35 cases, nine hospitalizations, many states out there, uh, zero deaths, but one of the big ones on this one was that uh, a lot of these were under the age of 21 and two of these people did develop hemolytic uremic syndrome. And the big issue with this is that uh, it went into frozen mini pizza slices. And these are things that kids love to have. It's very, very convenient where you've got these little pizza slices, you heat them up. And so they had to have this recall with uh, farm rich food products, et cetera, to get that out. So when we are looking at diagnostic recommendations, we're starting to look at what the CDC really wants of us out there. 
So why should we test? Obviously, uh, it's good to test for any pathogen so you know how to deal with it. Uh, but you want to keep these people hydrated. Uh, you know, if you want to uh, give them IVs to, to get the volume up, uh, they have found that to be helpful. But one of the big things is, you know, you don't need antibiotics for a viral infection. You also don't take antibiotics for uh, a sugar toxin producing E. coli. Uh, what they unfortunately have found is some antibiotics will actually increase the risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, so again, you know, here is this push. You know, people come in, I want an antibiotic, I want an antibiotic. Here's one of the really significant reasons why we're saying, no, 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 you run the test and an antibiotic is not going to do you any good and not only not going to do you any good, but potentially could do you harm. And they've actually even found things like uh, some of these antidiarrheal agents may also increase the risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome. So again, it pushes things toward understanding what the pathogen is. So why would you not take an, uh, an antibiotic? Uh, when you have E. coli cells, they've got this toxin in them. Uh, when you give some of the antibiotics that can actually lyse these cells, you're actually going to be putting more toxin into the environment. So as these coli are in the gut, they bind to the microvilli and they may be going up to the kidney. By giving potentially the wrong antibiotics, you can be putting out more of this toxin as it's going toward the kidney and therefore having a more significant illness. So here's what it used to be. Uh, when the CDC and the Joint Commission got together and said, okay, who's to be tested? You look at visible diarrhea, visible blood. Certainly that's very, very significant. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not all sugar toxin E. coli producers do have visible blood. So then they said, okay, screening, uh, the season is also significant. Again, we do see this more in the summertime, uh, more in the fall time when, again, people are out doing the water parks, doing more of the outdoor cooking, uh, exam, not getting that cooking straight through does cause this, but unfortunately this is something year round. We saw just a minute ago the cases of the, uh, you know, the frozen food slices where, you know, that could go on for quite some time. Uh, we do worry about age. Um, the young and the old are more susceptible to uh, some of these risk conditions. However, again, diarrhea occurs in everybody. So everybody's going to be uh, at issue to this. So when you look at it all together, when you looked at the statistics at the beginning, uh, diarrheal disease is quite common throughout the entire United States and is a significant worldwide pathogen throughout the world. So to really look at what you're dealing with, uh, one of the other big things is if you start seeing cases um, and you do have a diagnostic for sugar toxin producing, you can help start limiting that uh, potential outbreak because once they know there's an outbreak going on, the CDC can come in, they can investigate, and by identifying what the source is, they can then put out these, um, you know, concerns to the markets to potentially withdraw particular lots or to the consumers to make sure that they can check their lots at home to make sure that they are, don't have one of these suspect uh, cases. So when you put it all together, they've now said, basically, rather than look at those particular screenings, they really want uh, everybody tested. So when we look at the testing out there, we've got the 0157 and we've got the non-0157. Again, if you look at all the ones out there, E. coli 157 is the most common strain uh, that produces it. There's many, many other strains that have the Shigella toxin, but this is the big bad one. Now, because of that, some labs only test for 0157, but again, we do see, even in the cases in 2014, some of these non-0157 uh, strains were the etiological agent. So, you know, there's plenty of cases out there right now where if you are just running E. coli 0157, you will, will, will miss the outbreak. When you look at 0157 versus non-0157 assays, the 0157 uh, are specific just to that strain. Again, you'll miss anything else that can produce a toxin, but it's not that. Um, it's fairly inexpensive, though. That's the good news. Uh, when you plate these out, uh, you put them on a, a plate called Sobertel McConkie Yager, and uh, that tends to be the most common out there. Uh, when you're talking about the assays for toxin, you're usually talking about the rapids, the ELISAs. Uh, they're there as well, and they will pick up anything that produces a toxin. 
So what the CDC at this point now is saying because of these is they do want all stools tested coming in from the community with diarrhea for Shigatoxin E. coli. Uh, you can do concurrent testing. You can actually culture that stool for 0157 and you can look both for that Shigatoxin as well. And when you do find 0157, uh, the laboratories do like, the public health uh, do like having those isolates sent to them. They like to do the confirmation testing, the additional characterization. Um, that is all quite helpful. And of course, you want to re report those results promptly to the physician because that is going to direct their therapy. Uh, again, a lot of these tests, when you have the answer, you can direct that therapy much, much better. As far as that rationale out there, it's it's a bit difficult talking about this in that a lot of hospitals that do shigatoxin don't see tons and tons of cases. However, when the CDC has looked at this, they've said, okay, it is about as common. Shigatoxin E. coli is about as common as things like Salmonella and Campylobacter. And since it is about as common, it should be one of the ones that are tested as much as well. Again, uh, early diagnosis does help uh, with that therapy getting them off the antibiotics, keeping those kids hydrated. Um, all of those things help. And again, trying to limit that outbreak. So why every community acquired stool? Uh, again, many of these infections can be missed uh, with selective strategies. Uh, normally, you wouldn't test a form stool. It's just the, the diarrheal stools. Some sugar toxin, uh, again, you don't have the visible blood. Difficult to recover if you do wait and this goes the case with many, many pathogens. The longer you wait, the harder it is to recover. So if somebody's coming in with suspected sugar toxin and you're waiting several days to get it out, that may be resolving or at least harder to get. And it does help, again, prevent transmission to other people. It, these are people that if you do identify them and they have any access to be able to spread it, we really want to help educate them and limit them from doing that. So if, if, if these people are coming in, they have a sugar toxin producing E. coli and they work in a daycare facility, it's probably not the best strategy for them to go right back to the daycare facility. And even when the E. coli does resolve, when the, when the, when the uh, they should go quite some time really being vigilant, uh, washing their hands to make sure that they, they keep that up. Food service worker, again, it's, it's really, you don't want to be working with food after this. And even when it's resolved, you still want to take that extra time. When you've got your E. coli 157 cultures out there, again, we talked about the Sobertoma conchi agar plate. Uh, there are several companies that have nice chrome agar plates as well, where uh, when that E. coli 0157 is on that plate, uh, probably there's at least three companies out there that, that do it, uh, you'll see a nice color change. And so you'll be able to see that color change and identify it that way. Uh, when you're dealing with SMEC, uh, the issue is that these uh, particular bacteria don't ferment sorbitol, so you're going to see that white colony. It's about 16 to 24 hours. You incubate it for 37 degrees. Again, you look for that color. Uh, that color. Smack plates don't have that color, whereas if you're looking for the chrome argers, they'll have a particular uh, color to them. At that point, you've got the suspected colonies, and you're able to have a lot of the latex tests out there that actually work quite well when you're dealing with uh, isolated colonies. So you pick a few of those colonies, you can run the latex, and at that point uh, confirm that test. When you're dealing with a sugar toxin producing E. coli, uh, again this detects all sugar toxin producing E. coli rather than just a 157. As a caution, they have found some E. coli that can produce sugar toxin, but they don't have the right genes to actually bind and deliver the toxin to other parts. So with microbiology, there's no 100% answer for anything out there. So what do you test? Look at that manufacturer's instructions and you'll be able to see. Uh, usually you have two options out there. Uh, there are some tests that work for uh, direct stool, either fresh or frozen, and some work uh, much better on cultures. Um, and when you have the culture, it can be broth culture or plate culture. Uh, so the issue is direct stool, uh, obviously, you'll get same-day results. Cultures, you're going to be getting results in 24 hours. Now, surprisingly, there's actually not a lot of uh, molecular options out there right now, but there are a lot of public health laboratories that do use uh, molecular ones. So, um, and quite often, they validate it for isolated colonies, but a lot of people really aren't doing that right from the stool itself. 
So when you're looking at it, uh, unfortunately, doing these E. coli studies are not easy. Because it is more seasonal, uh, because you don't know where these outbreaks are going to strike, um, actually gathering the amount of data to produce an actual study is, is fairly difficult. So I don't, when I look at all the literature and try to compare things out there, there's not really a lot of literature to go to. So when I look out there, there were a few published studies uh, from Alberta, Canada that looked at the performance of rapid assays versus in-house PCR. And when I looked at that in-house PCR, they looked at a few of the particular ones out there, EHEC and the STEC. Uh, both of them did use, at this point, the enrichment culture. And they also tested that STEC on the direct stool. And some of the sensitivities out there and the predictive values are there. So uh, in that particular study, they had a sensitivity of about 35% on the EHEC from the broad culture, leading to a positive predictive value of about 54%. Uh, when they used the particular STEC assay out there, the sensitivity was higher, the predictive value was better leading overall to uh, particular different sensitivities with uh, different predictive values on that broth culture. And again, I won't talk too, too much about that. Uh, majority of the true positives weren't detected, unfortunately. They had uh, more de detected in that broth. Uh, they did, unfortunately, in one assay have a, a, a bit more false positives. So usually at least with a lot of these assays if you rely on either sensitivity or specificity it's a much better screen so if you don't either have a high sensitivity or a high specificity that leads to some confusion out there on, on what the next steps are so on, that was the good thing about one of these particular assays is um, with the higher specificity the predict positive predictive value was better out there so when we're looking at all this, when we're trying to uh, start preventing sugar toxin producing E. coli, I can't say enough. The first thing out there is hand washing. Um, every time after a person goes to the restroom, unfortunately, they're you know they've done the studies and the average person leaves about a tenth of a gram behind. So people aren't as efficient out there. Uh, of course, that can lead to things like issues with whirlpools. If you've got six people in a whirlpool and everybody leaves a tenth of a gram of feces behind and you've got multiple people getting in and out, quite often you better make sure that water is uh, chlorinated. Uh, again, the same thing with water parks. You have a lot of kids out there that can have a diaper and obviously they have uh, an accident in that diaper and they can be in that water and if you know water parks don't have that water chlorinated, they can be a source. Um, you got to make sure that you do it prior to uh, preparing foods, contact with animals. Again, if you're at a, a place that you're dealing with animals, especially with children, wash your hands afterwards. When you're looking at that food, you really do want to make sure that it is prepared appropriately. Uh, again, the big one out there is things like ground beef. If you like your steak rare, that's okay because it's a steak and again, you're cooking the outside when you're doing talking with a burger. It is a bit more uh, important to uh, cook that a bit through. Uh, cutting boards are a big one out there for microbiology. It happens over and over again, and unfortunately it happens in a lot of restaurants where um, if they've got some contaminated meat, they can be working with that contaminated meat and then start making salads and cutting salads right on that same board. That becomes a significant issue, and that can be the source. These cutting boards are something that has been the source out there for quite some time. So you got to make sure that when you're out there, clean those cutting boards. Uh, if, you, if you're in a restaurant having them dedicated to uh, steak versus other vegetables, because again, you're not going to be, you know, heating those vegetables afterwards. They're, they're not going to be, because they're not going to be cooked afterwards, they can be that source. Um, and I know a lot of people out there love things like raw milk and other things, but um, pasteurization does help. Uh, when you're dealing with raw milk, uh, if you do pasteurize it, you don't have to worry about E. coli 157, so that is a help. So looking at all that, it is more significant. So I was going to try to wrap it up to give 10 minutes uh, more for discussion. Uh, when we're talking about these sugar toxins producing E. coli, they certainly are a significant health threat. 
Um, diagnostic uh, testing uh, does help, and again, the big thing about that is it can direct therapy. So you've got the case right now where if you've got something and you can produce something same day, um, that does quite often help. Parents come in and they demand antibiotics. And if you're able to at least run some preliminary tests up front to say it may actually be a sugar toxin producing E. coli, I am not giving you the antibiotics for reasons X and Y, that will make the parents stop. If you don't have th th those answers quite often, the doctors go the other way, give the antibiotics or the patients demand them. So having answers either same day or 24 hours later do help. And I know a lot of people out there that run both because especially when you've got a bloody stool, this is something that you really worry about. And when you put this all together, and appropriate therapy uh, does reduce these complications, such as hemolytic uremic syndrome and thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which I'm glad I pronounced right because it is not the most easiest term. So with that, I was going to turn it over to any questions out there. Well, thank you, Dr. Moore, for that informative presentation. I'm thrilled to be part of the Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. Before we begin the Q&A session, I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button on the lower left of the presentation window. So let's just wait a minute to see if there are any questions. If there are no questions at this time, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Larry, for making today's educational webinar possible. Please make sure to head to the community of learning following this presentation to have the opportunity to engage in live chat with Dr. Moore and your peers and have any questions that you may have answered about shigatoxin producing E. coli, what you need to know now. As a reminder, I'd like everyone to remember that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through October of this year. You will receive an email from LabRoots informing you when this pres presentation is available. We invite you to forward that announcement to any of your colleagues who have not, were not able to attend today's presentation. Thank you all very much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Until then, thank you again, and goodbye.